Okay. Hi, Paul, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing very well. Doing very well. Um, very nice to have you on. Thank you so much for joining me. That's my pleasure. Oh, <clears throat> I had um, discovered your work through uh, Mr. Peugeot and um, through Jordan Peterson, of course. I found your dialogue, your uh, interpretations of Jordan Peterson, your readings, and and kind of how you go through and dissect those. So very informative and, and easier for me to to couple with uh, theology a little bit whenever I could look because because Mr. Peterson kind of has one foot in one foot out as far as conviction of the Bible's concerned, you know, but his interpretations are so, so profound. And I found you as a great person, a medium by which to connect those two dots. And so oh, good. it's very good to have you on. And it's, I'm uh, very happy to have you. And I, I don't, if you don't mind, would you mind kind of explaining what, what your role is right now and, and your, your position? I'm a menace pastor of a local uh, Christian reformed church. That's Dutch Calvinist in the United States. Um, I found Jordan Peterson sometime in 2017 and uh, thought his work was interesting. And then when he started doing his biblical commentary, his biblical series, I found that very interesting. And I, in some ways, lacked conversation partners about it. And so I thought, well, let's make a video, see what happens. And I very quickly had more conversation partners than I ever knew what to do with. Yeah. And so I have kept doing conversations and commentaries and especially trying to help little community people form little communities for themselves so that they can, they can practice some of this and they can talk these things through and learn from them. So I've been doing that for the last four years or so. Awesome. Well, that's great. Um, I, I know that you may have seen, I kind of, I kind of started this YouTube um, channel to have discussions on consciousness and and kind of what that means and how that fits into our experience first hand, first person and, and then how we look at it in the third person. And, and as I was doing that over the last several months, it led me to back to where I started as far as Christianity is concerned. And uh, I found that very intriguing and wanted to uh, speak to more people about it. Um, and what I, what I kind of wanted to start off with just asking you, I, um, I find one of your, one of your discussions you and Mr. Peugeot had that were so fascinating um, about the meaning crisis and, and how you see that and, and how you see that meaning and crisis unfolding in our world um, as far as what that really means. Because we say meaning crisis, and of course, it can, it can strike a bunch of chords. Um, but would you mind kind of explaining kind of how you see the meaning crisis uh, briefly if you, um, and kind of what that means to those that, that may hear that phrase? John Verveke, a uh, Canadian cognitive scientist who was a colleague of Jordan Peterson when Jordan taught at University of Toronto, was really the one who brought that term to the fore. And it has everything to do, I think, with the idea that in modernity, the only being allowed in public discourse that had agency and consciousness were human beings. And as cognitive science continued to develop, and as a lot of sort of second level thinking began to develop, uh, even the agency and humanity of human beings was threatened to the point that a, a basic nihilism sort of sets into the culture where nothing matters. And this is sort of where Jordan Peterson picks up on it because Jordan Peterson very much detected that nihilism and, and began to address it with meaning directly and began to suggest that meaning itself, itself was a tell and an indication of uh, an indication of truth and knowledge. And so I've followed along those trails. John Verveke basically saw that a lot of what has led to meaninglessness and nihilism has been the loss of religion in people's lives. And so he himself is a non-theist. And so he's been working on what he's called a religion that's not a religion, whereas Jonathan Peugeot and I basically have noted that there's a degree in which a meaning crisis follows the, the abandonment of religion. I don't tend to find religious people suffering from this as much. And so for many people, the way out of the meaning crisis was, in fact, an embrace of some sort of religion. Okay, yeah, understood. And like, and as, as Jordan Peterson's kind of said in the past too, whenever that religious element is lost, 
it may not even be so much lost as it is reattributed to another form of another outlet or another another manner by which to express this ultimate good or this objectivity we all kind of lack lack and foresight and finding and so it outlets in ways of you know um, upheaval against the system upheaval against the leaders and that kind of becomes a manifestation of this religious outlet this logos or, or so to speak that if it's lost and not placed in in religion then it can find its outlet elsewhere and that becomes an issue because then people aren't really actually upheaving against societal structure so much as they're upheavaling against the lack of an objective logos so much so yeah i i think a lot of what's going on in society is a belief that we can sort of create our own foundations in some ways it's it's nietzsche his his prophecy being implicitly fulfilled by masses of groups that imagine that we can somehow well first of all we sort of borrow some of the ethics of Jesus in terms of um, human dignity and some of those things. And then we imagine that we can simply reconstruct a new world um, without that same foundation, but it, it usually just doesn't hold together. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't hold together. And then it, it, it arises in different forms because every eventually cultures across the world do come to these same conclusions, regardless of geographical separation from each other and, and, su and such like that. And so it is interesting to me to see kind of how it potentially, yeah, we are almost all our books were written kind of platonically and through the Bible. I mean, they set the stage for how we kind of operate now thought wise and also narrative wise. And so the Bible seems to make its appearance here and there. And um, I, uh, I, I was a very strong militant atheist for a long time. And I recently found my way back to Christianity. And it's been it's been a very rewarding journey and not not for myself so much just for my objectivity and my arrangement to the higher good and how to operate in the world. And um, through doing that, it came from the inquiry into consciousness. And one thing that I noticed you and Jonathan talking about, Mr. Peugeot, uh, was how Jonathan said Peugeot, he was, he was optimistic about this inquiry into the nature of consciousness, hoping he even made a mention of this inquiry potentially being something that actually does lead to science, putting science behind the inquiry into religion and subjectivity and, and spirit versus body and things like that. He had mentioned that consciousness and this inquiry coming back around into the hard problem of subjectivity in the world might lead to something positive as far as solving the meaning crisis. Um, what, what would be your kind of thoughts on, on this first person examination of our experience, making a, a reappearance on the scientific stage instead of a third person view? Do you think that potentially this inquiry could lead us to uh, reformulating our, our perspectives towards religion maybe as, as far as new atheism is concerned? Well, part of the development of science was intentionally removing the first person perspective. To, to in some ways depersonalize the world in order to arrive at a much more mechanistic system and what that would afford for individual persons and agents is the, is the manipulation and the employment of that system in order to achieve the outcomes that the first persons wanted to have. Yeah. Now, where this led, I just finished recording a little video on the conversation between Jordan and Sam Harris, where this led is, is to sort of where Sam Harris is at, which was on one hand, the scientific view of the world, which said, there are no persons, there is no agency, it is, it is all deterministic. But then the manifest image, which we live in, where we have persons and agency and purpose and all of those things. And part of the reason that modernity has been bottoming out is there's no way to bring these two images together. And so what happened in philosophy was, was phenomenology to try to get around this problem. Um, Jonathan Peugeot very much has emphasized the first personal to, and, and that basically also gets around this problem. The difficult questions are going to be, what about some of the ways that the third personal, we, we can't throw away the third personal completely yeah. because all of our systems are built on that. It's basically, a, it's basically imagine as if there are no agents in the world 
and the world works in a certain way, then all these things are true. And many of these things are true enough that they work reliably for us. And that way, the, the, the pragmatists were, were quite correct. But there are limits to that because we can only appropriate that through the first personal. Yeah. So I don't know how that will evolve. I tend to suspect the two will continue to sort of butt heads against each other until bit by bit, tiny little ways into each other will emerge and when hopefully we'll make some progress with that yeah but it's 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 not clear to me exactly how this is going to be pursued there are i think some indications and i think those those findings are going to come through the religious because i think in almost um with almost all of these steps the, that the religious anticipates the resolutions later on down the line. That's a much older view of sort of the hierarchy of thought that that religion is sort of at the top because it's really at the bottom and then everything sort of flows from there, but it's gonna take a long time. And, yes. and right now we're just at the point of achieving a degree of critical mass in popular culture as people begin to recognize, oh, a hundred years ago, they said religion was going away. Now, religion is not going away, but many of the many of the challenges with religion remain, and so that conversation is going to continue. Absolutely, yeah. No, that's a really good take. Um, it seems like religion ends up being the answer because the books that that are written in, especially the Bible. Whenever I started probing into the hard problem of consciousness and trying to understand the subjective element of our experience you can't get anything more directly narrative, narrative, like as far as the narrative is concerned in the Bible, the intersection of your life is almost encapsulated somewhere in the Bible. You can almost intersect the narrative of the Bible and the archetype described with your life in such a way that it almost answers the press question of consciousness for me in a certain way, um, unscientifically, so much, so to speak, but narrative, because having an appreciation of the, the drama of narrative in your life and how your life can be enveloped within a narrative um, is a scientific kind of understanding because it, it becomes true. It becomes almost like you have to couple this logical, practical, analytical side with this narrative. And that's kind of the basis for creativity too, in a certain way to me. And, and understanding the intersection of narrative and archetypes in the Bible with, with experience and seeing how parallel they are, it becomes a, almost a, a truth in that, in that regard to me. And I know that um, kind of going back to just briefly on, on you and Peugeot's conversation with consciousness, Peugeot kind of made, kind of fr phrased it as a caricature of the first person kind of like put forth by Richard Dawkins, where it's like, if you look at reality as you're the scientist looking through the microscope at the slide of the universe, and Sam Harris even captures it sometimes where he says, removing the observer from what's being observed, as if you observing it doesn't collapse the wave function of society in right. such a way. Right. And so I think that there's something to be said about about first person being an inquiry that's almost, they call it a hard problem for a reason. And religion answers those hard problems to me sometimes. Well, it's only a hard problem because you've made it a problem in the <laughs> third personal. Yeah. That's why it's a hard problem. You've, in, in a sense, again, you, you said, okay, we're going to use the scientific method. We're going to extract the observer and we're going to imagine we're seeing it as such. I often call that the a monarchical vision. Yeah. Okay, so there, so now suddenly we have to get observation back into the picture. Well, you've, you, you intentionally took it out. So yeah. that's, and, yeah. and then there's this, there's this amnesia, there's this scientistic amnesia that says, well, we can observe science. It's like, wait a minute, who's we? Because yeah. all science is observed. And they say, well, but my observation of it isn't subject to, the interpretive problem. No, any observation is subject to the interpretive problem. Yes. So you don't you don't eliminate the interpretive problem. So that's that's kind of where the conversation is stuck right now. But these things usually take decades or even centuries to work through. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. It, it, but it's an interesting paradigm there to see. Okay, well, the first person provides us the reason to do third person analysis, and so right. at, and like you were mentioning, Peterson and Harris's uh, discussion that just kind of released. I was listening to that as well, and I captured something in there where both him and Peterson agreed that 
without value, there is no fact. And to me, that kind of settled with me a little bit because I was like, you know, that's kind of an admittance on both of their sides of saying that you have to have a grounding to a sim like to objectively orient towards to know to have a reason to even investigate in a third person. And that right there kind of proves, okay, well, there's a logos there for that. Um, and I've been using the word logos a lot, kind of hearing it from you and Jonathan Peugeot. And, and I, I like the, the idea and the weight that that word carries and, and, and Christ kind of formulates that logos for me. And as far as how I'd like to orient in the world um, and how I'd like to be in the world, just because I've never found a more profound way of being elicited by one human, just written so profoundly. And, and that whole idea without value, there's no fact. And I, I found myself whimsically operating in the world as an atheist, kind of without orientation towards a goal, without reason to do whatever I'm doing isn't going to have an effect on my future self. So why worry about it kind of thing? And finding the Bible allowed me to reorient at least towards something at a hierarchy of value. Um, and I think it's something critical there that without value, there is no fact, as they said, that's kind of a, a religious inquiry or a religious statement in itself. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and theologically, that's been around a while. So my own, my own Dutch Calvinist tradition has had quite a bit of presuppositionalism in it. And that was, it's a similar idea that there are, there are, you need to have these, these presuppositions. Another way of looking at it is the frame problem in cognitive science. You can't see anything without a frame through which to see it. Yeah. And whether they're frames or presuppositions, those things always remain and they're pre-rational. And so the imagination that you're, that a, an impersonal observer is going to construct the world rationally, just, it, it just doesn't cohere. And yes. that's, and, and the, the realization of that lack of coherence is part of what's spreading and part of what continues to basically undo modernity. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what they talk about. They talk about postmodernism and, and everything being so oriented towards tyrannical source seeking of power, almost so as to degrade the idea of simply becoming powerful, like being powerful is synonymous with tyranny almost. Um, and that's kind of a postmodernistic view of it is, OK, well, anything you attempt to do to elevate your oneself, you're doing it because you're overtly seeking this power over others or something. And it degrades kind of the the idea of building a hierarchy of values. Because if you establish a hierarchy of values, you say, well, my value is to be more like Christ and I'm gonna work towards that and also attribute that to what I do in the world. Well, then you're doing that to be tyrannical. Your ultimate goal is to assume the priesthood and then have power over others. And so that, that mere attempt at assuming a logos and, 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 and operating in conjunction with it becomes in itself a, a tyranny or something like that. Yeah, it's kind of a one trick bulverism. C.S. Lewis coined that frame oh, okay. a bulverism. And it's a it's a motivation that is intended to discredit any action or argument by someone saying, oh, here's the problem. It's a it's you're motivated by this. That itself has some very interesting first personal aspects to it. Postmodernity is in some ways was sort of a first draft to attempt to address this problem of modernity. But it's what what has been known as postmodernity is increasingly found to be um, substandard because it just sort of it sort of caves into the hermeneutics of sus the right. hermeneutics of suspicion via Marx and Freud. Yeah. And, it goes way back. Yeah, it finds yeah. Its, it finds its thread through all that. I see yeah, and Nietzsche like. that it's all just power. It's all just power. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And but is yeah. is power really what I want from this world? Is that all that I want? Do I derive absolutely so much enjoyment uh, manipulating and dominating other people? Is and <laughs> the uh, the answer to that is no, not really. Um, yeah, you yeah. know, if I really want to control something quite a bit, I might be a very determined dog trainer. But you know, you can even look at let's say the original Star Trek I Mud. It was a very interesting, it was a very interesting episode where this guy was marooned on a planet. And so he built all these beautiful female robots who were completely subject to his will. He wanted off because he, he couldn't, he couldn't stand it anymore as if, as if power alone will satisfy. And it, and it, it really doesn't. No. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you there. I think that's a very accurate. Can, can you hang on one second? Just yeah, pause. Sure. I got someone knocking at my door. Absolutely. No worries.
no problem at all. Um, not a problem. I, I, uh, I was thinking too, um, that just consciousness itself was an inquiry that led me back to religion and not to go too deep into that because I really wanted to ask you a couple questions, not, not theologically rooted so much. So as just rooted in, in the idea of faith and get your opinion of that, because what had happened to me on my journey or not journey, but just my phases of my life when I was an atheist. And when I found my way back from atheism, I kind of was a disciple of people like Richard Dawkins. I was a disciple of people like Sam Harris and both of whom I respect immensely and, and, and have learned a lot from, but what, what had happened was this degradation of the word faith almost, I feel like, and to where it had been redefined or possibly re reevaluated into a term that is associated with this, this imaginary belief in non-logically rooted thoughts and this, this giving up of your, uh, your your coherence to this deity or something a man in the sky or or kind of something like that and i feel like you would be a great person kind of to ask on on your take on faith because i started to reframe the word faith to myself recently and kind of see it more as i had to have more faith almost as an atheist in something i was faithful that the next day would come i was faithful that i would go to work and get paid i was faithful in something i was faithful in the acts of human beings to serve you know to supersede my logos essentially and I think that was pretty detrimental to to kind of my understanding of religion, and I wanted to get kind of your opinion on how you define faith, so to speak, and and how you see it, and, and how you preach about faith. I think when when faith is defined as um, attempting to know something for which you don't have evidence, that's a really lousy definition of faith. I think at least faith in terms of what the Bible talks about has much more to do with trust. Now, every time you get on an airplane, you trust in an entire network of persons and usually netted together through institutions that everyone is going to do as they say. And you have a competent pilot, you have competent mechanics, you have competent engineers that constructed the airplane, you have competent business people that are running everything. There's an entire network of trust of, of individuals and institutions that you place your trust in to get on that airplane. Yeah. Now, it's, it's absolutely impossible to live without a level of even implicit trust that there isn't a tiger behind the bush, that um, the people that with whom I'm sharing a home aren't secretly plotting, you know, my death. There's all sorts of things like that. And, and this is all, these are all the faiths by which we live. And so part of what happens in Christian faith is that a big part of where I think the conversation went wrong in the late 20th century, sort of kicked off by the new atheists, was on one hand, God became a little bit too, let's see, it's hard to say too, because that, 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 that's true. A, a certain aspect of God that had already been assumed and understood within Christianity was lost. And that is sort of the the presence of God throughout the system. And so, whereas obviously, I don't think it's unreasonable for someone to look at evil in the world, suffering in the world, and say, oh, I've, I've, I've got some doubts, I've got some wonderings. Could this world, in fact, be run by a benevolent God? I, I don't, I don't, hold that thought against anyone given the given the the amount of suffering in the world if you sit down with that question long enough you then have to deal with the question what is the source of good in the world because on one hand there is a lot of suffering in the world but there is also a lot of good in the world and and once you realize both of those things you're now sort of thrown back on the kinds of conversations that human beings have been having throughout their history. Is, the, is this world the product of two opposing deities who are sort of duking it out together? So is it sort of good versus evil? 
And once, or is this world the product of, let's say, a Gnostic answer, which would be a substandard God who wasn't smart enough to sort of put the world together. And, you know, we should all aspire to an immaterial God who will, you know, once we are loosened from the confines of our decaying flesh, then in, 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 in now then being immaterial, we can then like live as forms in some sort of platonic heaven. I mean, people have been talking about these ideas for a very, very long time, trying to sort of puzzle out the way the world is. Yeah. So, so over a long period of time, and especially then through the, the, the teachings and the assertions and the resurrection of Jesus, and then his followers, different answers about how the world is, is constructed came to be. And those things have been debated and pushed around and nuanced for, for 2000 years now. But much of it, much of it winds up, of course, built on the the substructure of of the Old Testament and the story of the Hebrews. Yeah. Most of this, you know, the Apostle Paul, for example, at the beginning of the Book of Romans, says, "The righteous will live by faith." Well, what does that mean? Well, in many ways, to continue to move forward with our stories, believing that, let's say, being itself is not evil. And it's not merely neutral, which would sort of set up the two gods, but yeah. being itself is good. Oh, wow. Then despite the evil, despite the doubts, despite the sufferings, you move forward in faith. And that's not functionally different from, let's say, let's say you're a foreign missionary. And instead of flying what you believe are all of these trustworthy first tier airlines, you're going to get on some little rickety airplane and you're going to look the pilot in the eye and say, are we going to make it? The pilot's <laughs> going to say, I think so, but um, we, we need to try. And so you get on that plane and that in fact is faith. Yeah. And so what Christian faith does is looks at all of these elements in many ways pinned by the resurrection of Jesus Christ to say, all right, I've got my doubts. There's certainly challenges out there. It's not really a syllogism that I'm building up, but I am going to take on faith the witnesses to the resurrection, the credibility of centuries of Christians before me, the credibility of my parents who taught this to me, the credibility of the kinds of people in the church who continue to convey this message that this is, in fact, how to move forward in this world. We do it by faith. It doesn't mean I have all the answers. It doesn't mean I'm not going to suffer. It doesn't mean any of those things. But faith is the posture by which we move into the future. And I think that's what we mean. It's not that we have no evidence. No, I've got plenty of evidence. It's, it's not that I have certainty. The book of Hebrews contrasts faith with sight. I don't always have certainty. Sometimes I feel certainty as a feeling. But in fact, many times in the world, I decide, okay, I'm going to trust Jesus. And on behalf and because of that, I'm going to do the kinds of things Jesus did, such as loving my neighbor all the way up to and including my enemy. That requires faith. Because often in this world, loving your enemy doesn't help you too much. So yeah. that's, that's the kind of thing that I believe Christians believe faith is. That's a that's a really beautiful way of putting words to that. It really is. I, I I took a lot from what you just said, and and I think it's such an important reframing of faith. And the reason I think it's important is to help the transition um, of people who are like I like I kind of was with the discipleship towards Harris or Dawkins or Hitchens or or any of that. The, the only way I could have ever gotten here in a faster manner would have been by helping understand and a reframing of faith. Um, that way I could have logically justified its existence, essentially, um, uh, and, and understood it. And so I think what you just said and the way you said it, it's super important, um, at least for me. And uh, I think that people reframing their definition of faith is something that might might be a catalyst for, for helping um, people understand that it, it's not deeply, deeply um, 
I guess, schismed between science and faith, but that faith is the root of science. And like Martin Luther kind of said too, he said faith became a psychological reality of some type or, or became a reality because like you said, it's this guarantee that, that amongst chaos and like Peterson says a lot is this tap dancing between chaos and order, kind of like in music where you're, you're, you've got a lead guitarist and he's soloing in a big part of a song. Well, he's tap dancing right on the edge of what could be chaos or melodic order. Um, and there's a there's got to be a conductor there. And is that conductor conducting from a standpoint of somebody else is conducting against him, like a, like evil is rooting against him? Or is, you know, is there a, um, a force for evil that's trying to prevent that 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 symphony and melodicness? Or is that simply faith that, you know, that this is going to happen, that we are going to find order amongst chaos and believe that, you know, no matter how much chaos exists, we may be able to trudge through it, um, despite the obvious objective reality saying otherwise. Um, so I think it's a really beautiful way of saying and describing faith um, as, a, as a holistic point and as a virtue, really. And one of the things I was going to move forward and ask you on, on top of that was whenever we, whenever I was looking into the Bible before, I was trying to prove the Bible as a scientific manual or try to justify it against the standards of the modern world and try to use third person science to say, well, obviously we know seven animals didn't fit on a boat or seven of each or two of each animal didn't fit on a boat or the food supply would have been ridiculous. Well, of course it would. Um, but, but man, that is such a surface level way that, that deprived me of appreciating the archetypal narrative structure of what that story meant. And Peterson's dissection of Genesis was a dull eye opener for me to get back to where I'm at. And so I kind of wanted to follow that faith question up to you as far as when we try to go and prove the Bible, we're almost doing that simultaneous to the abandonment of faith, almost like we're, we're presuming the Bible to be false. And so then we proceed forward with third person objectifiable science to prove it. And in doing so, we eradicate the faith based premise. And so I kind of wanted to follow that faith question up to you about when we try to prove the Bible, we're abandoning faith and therefore it, 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 it not abandoning faith, but, but we're trying to use it as something that it's not meant for, so to speak. Yeah, that, that, that's a, that's a long old conversation. And a lot of the issues really revolve around issues of representation. What is the best way to represent? What is the best way to represent, let's say, a series of historical events. Now, the Bible, in some ways, events history and very much locates meaning within history. The Bible is not is is unlike, let's say, a lot of Greek or other pagan poetry that are telling stories about characters and beings and basically trying to shape the world in a mythological way. The Bible clearly has a mythological function and how it shapes the world for us. Yeah. But to imagine that first century and even more ancient authors must somehow subscribe to 20th century reporting standards is, is an anachronism. Now, part of what happened in the 19th century with the fundamentalist modernist feud is that a certain, a certain aspect of truth got elevated. And that was sort of a propositional correspondence theory of truth. And when that aspect got elevated in the culture, modernists basically looked at the Bible and says, well, the Bible isn't really trying to relay any history to us. And then fundamentalists rose and said, well, the Bible is, is perfectly relaying history to us. But their idea of perfection is this 19th century presupp you know, presumption of perfection that they are then project trying to project onto the Bible. And then you get a lot of weirdness between the two. Yeah. And to the, to the modernist, you have to say, it's pretty clear from the Bible that its authors were intending to relay history. But to the fundamentalist, you have to say, it doesn't mean they're going to relay history in the way that we would. And so, and, and the more we understand, the more we appreciate ancient texts and understand the way cultures impact representation of historical events, the better, you know, we can say, well, the Bible wasn't written by us. 
because yeah. we certainly wouldn't write it that way. And I think where Peterson sort of steps in and why he had the impact he had was he intentionally sort of tried to sidestep that entire debate yeah. and say, let's, let's read the Bible psychologically and mythologically and see what comes out of that. Absolutely. And I think his basically sidestepping the modernist fundamentalist feud just helped a lot of people because basically Christians and atheists had been working that feud for such a long time. The conversation itself basically became unproductive for people who had questions about how to live their life. And so Peterson basically sidesteps it and says, let's just read it mythologically. And I'm not going to answer those questions one way or another, but I just, just like to see it psychologically and mythologically and see if that gives us some wisdom for living. Great point. Yeah. And that's kind of what Peterson does in his personality lectures is he references marionettes, Pinocchio, Lion King, mythology or re-representations of mythology um, in Disney movies, things like that, whatever. But he captures those archetypal forms of being, those person, those personas, or as Carl Jung would say, you know, the, the tarot-like archetypes, the magician, the fool, the, the thing and that and the other. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's so critical, I think. That's a really good point that Peterson was able to get that conversation that we are all worn down of hearing the christian versus science versus faith we're tired we were kind of burnt out on that discussion we had hitchens dennett uh, harris people like him and they're great in the minds but that debate had just become so solidified within what it was going to be there was no way out and it's almost like what you said peterson sidestepped that debate and attacked it from here's the archetype the narrative here is how it applies to analytical psychology, how you think, how you evolve as a human through your own present life, and helps to encapsulate, okay, this book may not be subject to the same pressures of third-person observation. It may not need be subject to those same pressures. And in that, in that doing so, it was able for me to see this, like, oh, I can couple this scientific knowledge I have that I've, I've devoted my life to trying to find and really pair it with this. And then you've got this conglomeration of brilliant narrative that's unexplainable in its magnitude. I mean, it really is to me, reading Exodus, reading Genesis, reading the book of Job um, and, and seeing Job's begging to God for these philosophical answers almost to say, how does evil exist? How does good exist? And it led me to people like Nietzsche prior to getting to the Bible. And Nietzsche just worn me down more because it made me feel more nihilistic. And uh, then finding my way to the Bible, it just eradicated all of those writings that were nihilistic to me. And I, through your work, through your discussions, a lot of that really helps looking at it in this analytical, psychological man manner, because eventually it leads people who may be atheists to the realization of, of what this means, of what the, the, the logos that's defined and, and, and demonstrated so clearly through the life of Christ and I think that's really neat. And something that I talk about that I've been talking about on my channel or a little bit here and there since I just started it is the idea of free will and the idea of choice and individual sovereignty um, within the world as, as reality exists to us. And uh, you mentioned John Calvin or Calvinism. And I, I don't know too much about Calvinism. I was going to ask you, first of all, if you don't mind briefly kind of explaining kind of what the Calvinistic view of Christianity means. And then also how they interpret free will in the sense of autonomy and personal, personal yeah. Um, yeah. action. So if, if many people out there think Jordan Peterson is somehow against gays and women and trans people, a lot of analogous to that is a lot of people hear Calvinism and think, oh, Calvinism is about determinism and... Um, and, and lack of human agency. Yeah. My, John Calvin was a second generation reformer who was a French refugee. He had to leave France because France was taking a pretty hard line against reformational ideas. It's a very complex history. There were elements of the Roman Catholic Church, the Jansenists, who in many ways adopted many similar ideas. Calvin basically came to fame by virtue of his writing. At that point, the printing press was still fairly new culturally, and Calvin became quite popular writing his, his institutes, institutes of the Christian religion. And, and really what Calvin tried to do was synthesize some of the observations of the first generation reformers 
like Luther and Zwingli without losing some of the longer standing uh, theology of the church. And I see, I see Calvin as, as really a synthesizer trying to mature some of the aspects of the Reformation. And this, this holds in some areas such as Calvin's theology of the Eucharist, which I would, I would say emphasizes the real presence of Christ. A friend of mine, Brett Sockold, recently wrote a book on um, transubstantiation. He's a Roman Catholic scholar in which his, his assertion, his thesis, and I think he's right, was that Luther basically wasn't really understanding Aquinas, and he was trying to get back to Aquinas, and that's sort of how consubstantiation arose. But but Calvin came a little bit a little bit closer with his real presence, which which better understood the the Eucharist. Now, Calvin synthesized a lot of that stuff. A century after Calvin, a lot of people, as sort of proto modernity continued to develop in the system, a lot of a lot of ideas that tended to at least formally get more modernistic began to develop into the tradition. I see. Okay. Yeah, I see. And so Calvinists are, are sort of a, a strange bunch in the Protestant crew. They eventually, in many ways, became sort of the dominant voice in Protestantism. Lutheranism continued and took a slightly different shape, but Calvinism sort of took on a much more dominant rationalistic voice and really seeded many of the forms of Protestantism that would emerge then in the 18th and the 19th and even some of the early 20th century with many Baptists are proto, are have elements of Calvinism in them, um, Presbyterians, obviously, Continental Reformed, obviously, but a certain a, a certain approach to the world, and Calvin, I think, tries to maintain sort of the traditional tension between these two books, so general revelation and special revelation, yeah. and and Calvin, with his commentaries, with his writings, with his institutes, tries to sort of bring that into um, into the modern world. There's certain elements of it that that continue to stick, one of which is sort of an anti-Gnosticism in that a lot of Calvinists will sort of frame or, or, or outline the story of redemption as creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Yes. And, and that's, a, that's a fairly typical Calvinist move. And, and so that was, that was the tradition that I was raised in. I, the Dutch Calvinists in America, for example, founded Calvin College, which is now Calvin University. And, and they, like many in sort of the, what became the neo-evangelical movement, really tried to sort of keep a theology of the mind and also a theology of the heart sort of in balance. I see. And, and that's, so that's the tradition. That's the tradition I was raised in. Now, in the, so you have the, the neo-evangelical movement in the middle of the 20th century that sort of gives birth to the seeker movement in the late 20th century. A reaction to that then becomes the emergent movement. And part of that emergent movement is the young, restless, and reformed movement in which a lot of, um, sometimes they're called new Calvinists, sort of emerged. And they, they've tended to emphasize more of the 17th century distinctives of Calvinism. And I, it's, it's interesting that the new Calvinists and let's say the new atheists sort of emerge at the same time, because in some ways, in some very weird particular ways, Sam Harris is sort of a new Calvinist, but he's an atheist. Yeah, yeah, I see what some you mean. Some of the predilection to determinism, um, some of the predilection to, to some, uh, Sam Harris really squares his system in a very strange way. Nice. And I see actually some, some similarities with that, with certain forms of Calvinism. So 
there, there's a lot going on there. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, so yeah, when yeah. I identify as a Calvinist, which is absolutely reasonable because I'm a Dutch Calvinist, people then sort of say, well, you're like a new Calvinist. It's like, well, I've got some similarities to new Calvinists because they are Calvinists, but there are some ways in which, especially Dutch Calvinism, dealt with modernity in a little different way. If you look at some of our lights like Abram Kuyper and Herman Bovink and, and, and sort of what Calvin, Calvin College did in the mid 20th century. So there's, there's a whole lot of theology and interchurch drama that goes into there. But part of what Calvinism, I think, affords me now is, especially in a context like this, with the meaning crisis is a, a bulwark against believing that um, my salvation is up to me. Now, I certainly have responsibility. And that's where sort of this Calvinists are like these frozen chosen determinists that I understand where people get that take, especially listening to certain Calvinists and reading some Calvinist material, but I never see Calvinists actually live that way. Yeah. Calvinists, in, in terms of how they actually live, sort of on one hand, tend to be fairly activistic in, um, you know, because my defining threesome I get from the Heidelberg Catechism is misery, deliverance, gratitude. All of our energy, all of our activity needs to be motivated by gratitude. We're not attempting to save ourselves. We're responding to a salvation that has already been accomplished for us. And so on one hand, you can see that's deeply Calvinistic. Yes. And, and it's also the fact that I am not, a lot of people imagine that their, their salvation is dependent upon their grasp on God. And a Calvinist sort of inverts this and says, no, my salvation is dependent on God's grip on me. And the reason that affords me comfort is because I know how fickle I am. I know how dim I am. And so if I have to choose between my ability to grasp God or God's ability to grasp me, I'll take that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're really so that's over that's there. sort of I I get a I a lot of people people seldom ask me this question directly. Oh, okay. Because it's not an easy question to I, answer, but because they listen to me and say, "Well, you're kind of a weird Calvinist." I was expecting to hear some other things out of you, yeah. but that's sort of how I understand Calvin and how I apply it in my ministry and in my life. <laughs> No, I like that. Yeah, I didn't mean to put to ask too loaded of a question or anything. No, it's not a loaded question. I'm happy to I, answer. I very, I very much appreciated what you just said, and I really stuck with me. I know it was towards the end, but that's not why it stuck with me. Um, the uh, misery, deliverance, gratitude, right. the threefold platform that means a lot to me, and and it sticks with me. Just paralleling it to, I go back to Job. I go to Jonah a lot. I like these prophets in the Old Testament that seem kind of haphazardly tossed into the Old Testament sometimes. Um, not haphazardly by any means because they carry weight of gold, but um the idea of misery deliverance gratitude and it's almost like gratitude the deliverance and gratitude almost have to coexist to a certain extent because to be delivered requires this acknowledgement of gratitude amidst the amidst the turmoil um and that theme in the bible and this idea of of receiving this grace from christ in the new covenant receiving this forgiveness it it's not something that's lightly it's not it's not an easy calling it's not something that you hearken after and do it half-heartedly it's, it's something that, like you said, if it's a predetermined salvation of some extent and then inflexible within that terminology, then it re, if you accept this, like you have a choice, if you do and you follow this call, it becomes your consciousness. It becomes your way of being. And inevitably, gratitude is on the, the other side of that. But it's gratitude is also that medium by which you accept the deliverance from that turmoil. It's, it's you come to that realization of gratitude being primal I and mean, being foremost in your life, being the only reason you were able to be delivered 
um, kind of. And so I think it's, it's a theme in the Bible is this hardship and this transcendence of suffering and, and this Abraham lounging around his father's tent till he was a 70 years old and then going to on a calling. Well, he had been in misery. I mean, he had been locked in turmoil or, or in a, in a sloth like existence, so to speak. And, and went and did this and went and found this calling and found gratitude for God along the way as the key to unlock the door to deliverance from it. And so I think it's a really neat way of framing it. Um, Calvinism is a complicated topic and we all have different ideas of what that means, of course, but I think, I think it's uh, very neat. I think the way you just described it. So I, I appreciate that. Um, one of the other things I was going to ask you about in relation to theology, of course, is something kind of to do with archetypes that are presented in the Bible. Um, it seems as if there's a narrative archetype presented in the Bible whether it's through a prophet of the Old Testament, whether it's through Abraham, whether it's through a disciple, there's almost an archetype for all individuals. Like it's, it's almost like you can read the Bible and almost everybody can parallel at least something in their life to the tribulations that one of the people in the Bible had, had, had underwent in their life. Not directly, of course, and not almost synonymously one for one, but in some way or another. And I find that a comfort in that, but also a truth in that archetype that if you're searching for the Bible as a scientific manual and you're using it and you can't figure out how to justify that and you fall, you fall into that faith science debate forever. But if you can get out of that and you get into this realization of truth in narrative and truth in archetypes and almost in a way it became impossible for me to rectify the unending truth in these archetypes of these people in the Bible. And as a way to justifying the truth of the Bible with science is if you can transcend this idea and then look at the narrative of the structure of the Bible and understand that they highlight archetypes so heavily of human beings and how, how they are in the world. And then you can start following through these stories of some of these prophets and some of these people and seeing not directly, but in a, indirectly a, a parallel in your life, um, in, in, in an individual's life. And I think that can be of a lot of comfort to people. And it can help people who have the understanding. They can take narrative, connect the narrative to the archetype, connect the archetype to their already existing logical formation of the world, and then uh, and then find truth there. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to ask your opinion on on narrative structure and how it pertains to belief. I I think narrative is one of the most powerful powerful ways of shaping people. Because in some ways, we see each other as sort of these uh, skin-based creatures with hands and feet, and noses and eyes. But in many ways, that, that's, one, that's, one, that's one aspect of us, one, let's say, layer of analysis. But in many ways, my life is beyond this body, and it is better contained and better represented as a sort of story. Now, I appreciate the fact that what postmodernity does is sort of cast doubt on the capacity of any narrative to communicate any level of truth. And whereas I'll certainly concede that narratives are subject to, to, to distortion of many kinds, Narratives are an enormously powerful way of, in fact, communicating the truth about beings like ourselves, which in many ways are, by virtue of the number of aspects that we embody, the number of layers that we participate in, extremely difficult beings to capture. So you can take a picture of us and you know, well, here's a picture of me. And let's say all someone has is a picture of me. Well, there's, well, he's got a big beard and he's pretty white and pasty. His eyes are kind of bluish gray and his nose is kind of big. And, you know, yeah. you know he's wearing a blue shirt. Well, that, that's him. Okay. Well, what do you know about me from that picture? Not a lot. Well, yeah, we Kermit the Frog here. What's with that? We have all these theology books. What's with that? Let's <laughs> say I donate my body to science and some pre-med student at some university in Sacramento then has me lying naked on a slab. Well, what can and can they answer about me? Was he a good husband? Did he love his children well? What did he do for a living? So in fact, there are many, many layers of, of, of reality that each of us participate in 
far beyond merely this body. Narrative is an enormously powerful tool that in fact is deeply built into us and one way to represent a life is in fact an ongoing autobiography. And narrative sort of is very much in the language of that. And you can learn a tremendous amount about a person via narrative that you're probably not going to find from their corpse. You're probably not going to get from a photograph. And so I, you know, people cast doubt on narratives, but I have to say, I don't think we have anything better. I really don't. Yeah. You know, and I've heard you talk a couple of times on this particular subject, just when you were referencing Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson's original discussions, not this most recent one. And, and of course, you know that in that first one, it was like this impasse of wits where it was like, where do we stand to talk? Where do we start this? And that was neat to watch, really, because it was like the, meta, the mediator of the debate didn't really know that they didn't really know. But it evolved to this concept, essentially, as Sam Harris wanted to strongman the argument. He summarized it into, so you're saying, Jordan, that stories is what we're all about. <laughs> and, you know, basically trying to dumb the argument down a little bit, say, what well, stories are everything. And Jordan basically replied back verbatim and said, yes, that's what I'm saying. And then as Jordan and him talk and finish their discussions and go forward into their next discussions, you see this ultimate unveiling of Jordan's meaning behind stories being the root of it all. <laughs> um, and I find that so incredibly fascinating. Well, it's a tool that, I don't know that we have surpassed. And in fact, many of the most powerful media that we have developed are ways of telling stories. Look at film. Film is fundamentally a storytelling medium. Yeah. Novels, storytelling medium. You know, what we've done is sort of level up story because again, I think it's so deeply built into us and it's so powerful. That, now, that, that isn't to say that you can't lie with story. I'm like, almost the best way to lie is story yeah, because yeah, it's yeah. that powerful. Yeah. But, but none of that discredits or I think um, undermines the power of story for human beings. And that's why it's not going away. Yeah. And almost everyone who wants to discount story tries to use story in an attempt to discount it. And I find that all the yeah. time. If they're yeah. trying to make the point to discount narrative, they tell a story. And it's like... Yeah, yeah it almost becomes a self-defeating logical fallacy right. in the way that they're attacking their own argument in a circle. And then it arrives right. back at the narrative. Yeah, no, I see right. what you're saying. Give and us a list. Is that going to be more compelling? Well, yeah. I would give you a list, but it's not as effective. That's a that's a that's a candid way of putting it, and it's ultimately the truth. And right. uh, they validate it, the truth by what they do. Yes, <laughs> they might yes. they might be saying different things. Let me tell you a story about why story doesn't work. Yeah, well, let me tell you this grand narrative and tell you why your grander narrative fits within it but doesn't. Um, right, um, it, it, it doesn't hold together. No, it doesn't. And I have empathy for the thought that it doesn't because it seems like an elementary way of viewing the world. It seems like a step down from the scientific third person analytical view. Oh, well, we're dumbing it down to these ancient stories. Well, ultimately, science is a story somebody wrote and you're a participant in that story. So I have empathy for the reason why story would be downgraded below science as an analytical way of being. But at the same token, I was brought back to story through science, looking for looking for science to answer these questions and story ended up being the way to do it. Um, and Go, and just a transition from story to personal, this is a auto, like an autobiograph, the autobiograph that we write, biography that we write of ourselves and our life that formulates this string of memories. And, and then we turn that into this egoic identity with, of the self um, is a topic in, in, in vogue right now in mindfulness and things like that. And, and I found my way to this through some mindfulness stuff and through Sam Harris's app, actually using, reading him, his books, I found the idea of self-transcendence to be interesting but i found it by the same token to be nihilistic and ultimately this is this is i, I promote being aware of your mind i, I would assume that's a good thing I, I don't know enough about it but i know that it helped me a little bit but i also know that it led me to the bible in such a way because when i started to whenever these things of no self and these things of self not existing and illusory free will those became and i'm not speaking against sam sam harris of course because i 
I think he's an excellent thinker and I think he's a promoter of ideas that help, but um, not against him, but me personally, the way I interpreted this no self and illusory free will was damning in a way that became nihilistic to the point of not resorting to the Bible, but ending up there in my search to replace the self that I had lost, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And, um, and I really needed that because I was transcending some traumatic experiences or whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, some, like everybody has suffering. I was going through that. I came out of it and I used mindfulness as a tool. And, and as I did that, I started to become real to me, some of these ideas of no self and illusory free will. And that became damning to my, not my viewpoint of the world. And then the Bible reinvigorated it. It brought back this meaning. And, and whenever he, Sam Harris talks about this voice inside your head and it's the ego and it's fake and it's a lie, whatever. And that may be true, but it helped me get to the Bible in a way that I lost the association with self in such a way that reality became a video game to me. And I was not playing it and me holding the controller didn't affect the outcome of the rest of the video game. And, um, Finding my way back to the Bible, I found that Jesus actually speaks on this. And he says, pick up your cross and follow me. To me, that was almost a self-transcendent verse. It was a verse of pick up all this autobiography, pick it up and carry it and don't drag it on the ground. Follow me, pick up this baggage, get over it, wake up, begin again. And almost like Eastern mystical writings and and self-transcendence and all that, which I don't mean to degrade. I just, I don't follow it. I don't believe in it that well, I, whatever. Um, but I found that Jesus spoke more in a way that whenever you just transcend the self, you're not meaningless. He told you how to find meaning amongst self-transcendence, uh, amongst that self-identity that you're so tethered to. Yeah, you don't really want that because you see whenever you can get over that, that you can produce gratitude. You can show virtue a lot easier. But if you don't have a logos by which to substitute for it, it becomes harsh uh, or it becomes a reality of nihilism. And so I would kind of want to just ask your opinion on, on this idea of meditation in the form of seeking self-transcendence and how that may fit in with a Christian worldview. Self, self-transcendence is something that we sort of do all the time anyway. It's, that's sort of third personalizing. Yeah. I think that's the heart of it. Now, I don't, I don't necessarily see an issue with the kinds of realization that you can that you can gather from recognizing the limitations of naive patterns of thinking. Yeah. And I think some of those tools of meditation do shine a light on on just exposing and showing some of the naive patterns of thinking. Now, if you're going to do that, in order to discredit the naive patterns of thinking, I'm not sure what you're left with. Yeah. Because you have to live, I mean, even in just his recent conversation with Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris talks about sort of the default mode of the mind. Well, there's a reason that's the default mode of the mind. (laughs) Go ahead and um, go ahead and sit there and meditating, transcending yourself, in the woods surrounded by wolves you will trans you will self um, transcend until you are out of your body <laughs> yeah you will tra- <laughs> there's a reason you have that default and the default is not evil but to to learn its limitations is not in and of itself a bad thing okay but if you privilege that and see that's that's part of the issue the the move he makes on one hand he says from the third personal there is no agency, there is no self, and the self is an illusion from the third personal. So he prioritizes that, first of all. And then he says, now we can, we are free to play in the first personal, but keep doing your psychedelics and your meditation in order to realize that the third personal is privileged. And it's like, hey, wait a minute, you can't live in the third personal. Um, There's no place for you there. And and then if he couples it with a bunch of other things he talks about, such as without your first personal, there's null, there's nothing. And so it doesn't seem strange to me to realize that if you keep following his program and if you're actually self-aware and you're paying attention to the world, nihilism will come. Yes, it did. Yes, And this is what we've been seeing. And yes. people got to nihilism and then Jordan Peterson showed up and it's like, you mean I have an option? I don't have to stick with nihilism 
And most people will reasonably say, okay, nihilism, I got it, but can't live there. Just like I can't meditate in the wolves, in, in the woods with the wolves, or they'll eat me. So it's actually legitimate and meaningful to pursue meaning. And, you know, in the video that I, I made yesterday, and I touched on it a little bit today, I, I, think, I think Harris basically says, the purpose of life is to avoid suffering. Yes. I don't think that's coherent. I think Peterson, I think there are limitations to Peterson's meaning gyroscope, but meaning is a much better answer because we will embrace suffering for the sake of meaning. Oh, that's so true. Yeah, that's a reality beyond, un you can't debate that reality because no. we do it all the time. That's and, and Sam Harris lives yeah. it. To everything I know, he's a loving father and a competent yeah, husband. Too. Yes. Which means, you know, a high status male like him, he could sleep around. He could leave his family. You know, he hasn't. Why not? He is embracing the suffering, the cruciform um, task of monogamy and being a faithful father. Why? Because it's meaningful. And that's not the only reason. He's also pursuing uh, an archetype and a narrative. And I think I wish he'd just say, you know, he's, yes. he's almost there. He's yeah. almost there. I feel like he's almost yeah. there. Um, and no, you're so right. He does do that. And I, and I, I have a deep rooted appreciation for Sam Harris. Um, I really do because of what he's taught me, what I've learned, but I, you're the first person that I've been able to talk to about this in a way where I got, I got a response that was identical to how I experienced it. I was going through what, what you were describing as that threefold process, and I was amidst the turmoil at this point. And I decided that as I exited that turmoil, that I pursued intellectual pursuits again. And Sam Harris was one of my, and I, I started doing meditation and realized, whoa, you mean this atheist idol that I had also did meditation? Oh, this is perfect. I can, I can stay an atheist and do that. Okay, I'll follow him like a disciple again, which once again, I still follow him in a certain kind of way, but he's, I'm not a disciple. Um, and I, uh, and what happened to me was I went, through the, I went through his program. It wasn't just him. It was Advaita Vedanta, non-dual meditations that arise from Hinduism and things of that nature, which helped me in a certain type of way, but it arose at nihilism at its utmost crux to a point where meaning became not, not just not a virtue, but not an idea, not a point, not even a, the word meaning didn't even have English language value to me any longer. And, and it really, and that reality became ultimately true in my waking up in the morning. And I didn't know why, and I didn't really mean for it to. And so then I started pursuing, okay, I've got to figure out what is good and evil. I've got to figure out good and evil immediately. <laughs> and I've got to figure that out and figure out how I can be good and if good matters. So I ended up at Nietzsche and I ended up in, then what saved me out of Nietzsche was Plato and reading the symposium and reading the discourse of love and, and how it's the glue that binds the world and, and stuff. And then I was able to identify again with some type of logos and see love as that logos. And then I was like, well, who has personified love in this world, in these religious texts? Well, is it Krishna? Well, maybe. Is it this? Nah. I went to Hindu temple and I found my way to the Bible. And I, 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 uh, I guess I'd say reading the book of Job and reading the gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke really, really did something for me. It's really deeply personal and it, and it, and it helped me out of this non-dual idea that it had had permeated my landscape of, of, of being and it wasn't the fault of mr Har dr harris it wasn't the fault of any of I, I had agency in all this and and it was a journey that needed to be had and, and agency but was only mine um but it was so much so that it's unspeakable to me the amount of help that listening to you mr peugeot listening to bishop baron listen and reading the bible helped me reestablish this complete and utter loss of logos that had occurred from pursuing non-dual practices in hinduism and not to disgrace hinduism or anything but it's so powerful to me what narrative did for me and so that's why i kind of wanted to wrap that question around a narrative and, and the way in which you answered it and the calvinistic pairing of transcending suffering and being that and then coming to gratitude those things are presented by mr harris and stuff but the thing is they're presented in a way that they're unattainable because you lose the meaning to pursue them. You lose the reason to pursue gratitude, even though gratitude may be preached. And so, so I really appreciate the way you, uh, the illustrative way you kind of described it was, is gratitude the medium by which you transcend the suffering and, 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 and things like that. That's a cool way of looking at it. But I, um, 
I had never heard just hearing you say that I identify so parallel with with that description and I I uh, had never heard that before. Just somebody really just say what I went through, not just using his app, but using non-dual practices of meditation and, and what they can do and how they led me to the Bible. But if I wouldn't have made it back to a, uh, an ultimate logos, what would have happened is, is kind of a, an odd question to ask. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It hasn't been my story. But Oh, no, I know. I know. I didn't mean to be in that. In, uh, in that in, uh, I kind of wanted to actually go past this um, and ask you, when I was just as I was talking about good and evil um, and Frederick Nietzsche and the determination, he writes on the genealogy, morals and things like that. And I still haven't come to a conclusion Christian wise. And, and I, I believe wholeheartedly in the divinity of the Bible. I, I really do. And I, th I think that um, that's inevitable for me, but I, I have a hard time. And I wanted to just get your perspective, your, your theological approach to good and evil in a way that is evil, this combative 50, 50 force against the good and I had been starting to see it as more like evil arises from the lack of the unconditional love being present in your reality or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't, I couldn't, and then trying to justify the existence of demons in the Bible and what demons are, what they mean, and is there this force that's combating against good? And I just, I'm having a hard time understanding that. And I know it's a broad topic. It can, yeah. it needs a giant brush and a canvas the size of the earth yeah. to paint it on, but kind of what, what you would say, maybe somebody who found their way back to the Bible, how they, how you look at in a, in a manner by looking at good and evil and how they are combative against each other in the present world. Well, it isn't, it isn't a 50, 50 dualism. And I think, I think the way to think about it is that evil, evil is certainly real. And there certainly are um, forces, agents, powers, realities of evil that are trying to rob God of his glory and rob us of our joy and um, destroy God's good creation. That, that certainly is true. But evil is, I think, something that is temporary and joy and glory and goodness are eternal. Um, I like it, it recently in, you know, in the um, Jordan Peterson, when his talk, beginning of his talk with Joe Rogan recently, was talking about music. And music is this, this very strange thing amongst us where it almost seems like we, we sense meaning non-referentially. And I, I read a bit of Tolkien in Tolkien's Silmarillion about basically it's Tolkien is riffing on a creation story. Iluvatar is the deity and Iluvatar makes music and basically that music brings creation into being. And then Melkor, who is one of Iluvatar's chief creations, then decides that he is going to sing a song of rebellion. And I think one way to conceptualize what's going on with evil is rebellion that um that it's a desire to stand apart from the giftedness of god that makes us and to in some ways be on our own to not participate in god's being but in order to establish our own being the problem is we really can't do that we're not up to that and so that, that eventually loses. But the, what, what's so cool about what Tolkien does with Iluvatar in the song is that Iluvatar manages to take the, the strains of Melkor's discordant, rebellious song and eventually turn it, to turn it into greater music. And in Christianity, that's what we see with the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ that the rebellion of the world is turned into greater glory. And we recognize that in narrative because much of our narrative, you have a, you have a initial state, let's say situation A, and then you have a problem. And, and often that problem is sort of a breaking of shalom, a breaking of the created goodness that God intends for his world. And that's going to somehow have to be overcome. And it's in the overcoming of rebellion that in some ways and even that that in some ways the glory of 
the glory of the created goodness gets magnified still greater. The Apostle Paul has this very interesting um, saying that the angels, that there's this word in the New Testament, epithumia. Thumia is just sort of the standard word for desire. Epi is a Greek preposition, which is sort of an intensifier. So it's over desire. And so the Apostle Paul will often talk about sin as over desire. Uh, I should love my wife, but if I over desire my wife and make her the center of being, um, I destroy my marriage. And in some ways, I might even destroy my wife, oh, and wow. I destroy myself. And so is this word is is almost always used by the Apostle Paul as a negative thing and almost a um, almost embodying in itself the pattern of sin of taking a good thing and making it an ultimate thing that's sort of the nature of idolatry but then the apostle paul uses this word to talk about how the angels feel about looking in on the salvation that christ is is accomplishing through us that's a very strange word to use in that and, and what it almost reflects is that the angels in their unfallen goodness are certainly filled with power and glory and goodness and all the good things of God. You know, they, are, they have not rebelled unlike fallen angels who have rebelled. But when they look at us who have rebelled and they look at our redemption, what they see is, in fact, a greater glory by virtue of God's power through the redemption to redeem. And we almost always see that in story. If you were to go to the movies and sit down with a movie and you see a story of a happy family and, you know, the jobs are good and the relationships are good and the meals are good and everything's wonderful, you might leave the movie theater and say, wow, that was sure a pretty amazing story about a really happy family, but nothing happened. Yeah. Almost all of our stories have this pattern of a lost shalom, a lost goodness because of rebellion and fallenness and sin and evil, but then a redemption by which, and this is, this is the amazing thing about us, is when we think about the Christian story, reformers such as Luther asked questions about after we are redeemed, and, you know, and we are not fully yet redeemed until after this life, after we are redeemed, will we fall again? And oh, that's a that's kind yeah, of a difficult. A will will what what will what will become of evil? And and Luther's answer and the reformers' answer and I, I could hear from the Catholic and the Orthodox. I don't know what their answers are. They're probably not too far away. But the idea is that finally we begin. So there are there are people who live outside my door here who are meth addicts and um, alcoholics. And now I've never tried meth. Um, you know, I've, I, I don't drink myself, but I could drink. There's nothing in my Dutch Calvinism that says I shouldn't drink, but I, I I'm just not terribly tempted to become a homeless alcoholic yeah. because yeah. You know, there are aspects of their life that they have, you know, I could see some, I could see some, even, even in that misery there every now and then there's little sparkles of something decent, but um, I'm not tempted by that. Yeah. So the idea of redemption in this great story is that what God does through our rebellion is accomplishes something in us that probably could not have been accomplished in any other way. Now, there's a hint at theodicy there, but it's really hard for us to really sort of put together an airtight theodicy, but there seems very much to be that story in the Bible that for all of the rebellion that happens from fallen angels and fallen human beings and rebellious principalities and powers, in the end, God takes that and can accomplish through that greater things. And, and, and often the biblical metaphors are something like gold, where you can have gold and ore and you crush the ore. And in order to actually get pure gold, you must put it in a crucible and refine it. You have to turn up the heat. And so 
on one hand, evil is rebellion, and it is not the evil and suffering that we commit, we participate in, and that we suffer from. This is not God's desire for us. But given that we have chosen this for ourselves, what God desires is that we are refined by this and that we come out of this greater than we came in. And, and even, let's say, as you've now come into the faith, you are in some strange ways possibly a better Christian for having taken the rebellious journey you have. Yeah. And I see that often in people. So yeah. I, I think, I don't know if, I, I think that's the best way I can answer your question. No, that was beautiful. I really appreciate the language. I re really, it really is. And, and you mentioned the addiction and, and the appeals of that life didn't shine through to you because obviously the future where, where I did, where I had fallen into that. Um, not so much so recently, but, but over the last two or three years, maybe a year or so ago, I was in the throes of that. Um, and regardless of my autobiography, that's where I was at. And um, I didn't see the appeal either. <laughs> but what I did see was the appeal in the present and unableness to reconcile present gratification with understanding that in the future, it would be worse if I gratified these present desires. I knew that was the case, but this cognitive dissonance that existed there wasn't strong enough to alter my behavioral action. And like you said, to me at that point, and amongst the throes of of what would have been an abusive relationship, things like that, that had been proceeding into this, I was able to get out of it, but not by my own accord. And I was able to only get into it with my own agency because I was intentionally turning my face away from what I knew to be right. And whether or not I wanted to admit that at the time, I never would have. But I know for a fact, <laughs> metacognitively looking back on that moment in my life, I knew I was intentionally turning away from what the route to good was. And so I, I, as an agent in the world, created my reality. I could not have gotten out of it without a story to help and a story that I could intersect with in such an archetypal way. And so to hear you say what you just said about the addiction and about those kinds of drugs, I was into those. And, and, unfortunate, and unfortunately, I was, but not unfortunately, because I look back on it now, I created all that. I created every bit of that. Just like in Job, when Job, Job acknowledges to God, even when he takes all the oxen and Satan's going to and fro in the earth, Job acknowledges that he created this he, to a certain extent. He still wants to talk to God. He wants these philosophical inquiries satisfied, but he's never really to the point of saying, so I'm trying to emulate Job in the way that I perceive it now because I find myself a lot of times, well, God dang God, like, well, how come I had to be in the circle? No, I created the circumstance. I was not able to deliver myself from these circumstances until I found some sort of divine connection. And it wasn't unique to me. This divine connection of salvation is most ultimately available. And I just happened to willingly finally have the willpower to reorient towards it. And through that was the only way that I would have been able to make such dramatic instantaneous change. There's no other way The medically, physically, the withdrawal, whatever may have been the case would have prevented it. But in this case, whatever force was helping me through this when I was crying out to it, I found connection to it in a way that allowed me to get, who just say, well, it doesn't matter what the suffering is that I'm going to undergo to just quit doing this now. I have to quit doing it now. Yeah. And so, and so in your work and, and your videos and the way Jordan Peterson throughout these last year for me, is, it's been this journey through this, this non-dual thing and, and, and transcending some, some suffering I created for myself, acknowledging I created it and, and finding a redemption arc. You were, whenever you second ago, when you were talking with your hands, you were kind of creating a, an arc shape. Yep. And that's kind of where that probably the origin of that, that, uh, ep, ep, you know, the etymology of that idea comes from is, is this arc because it's a parabola. It's a, it's a, it's a shape in mathematics. It, it's, and I, not that it matters, but it's kind of intriguing to me that, that it's a parabola, like E equals MC squared. Basically the equation for the universe is a parabola itself too. I mean, it forms a parabola, not that mathematics plays into this at all, but I find that, that this arc, this shape, this, this ideology is, is prevalent in the universe as, it's, as a whole, um, theologically and just universally. And, and so I think that what you just, uh, just kind of elucidated there with the, um, with the redemption arc and the transcendence, and if you just had this happiness per pervade through the whole movie, what would we just watch? We just watch bliss evolve into bliss and then death. Um, and so basically um, that, that is a really good encapsulating answer. And, I think 
for the most part, I don't want to keep you much longer. I just, I wanted to kind of end, but I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your answers. I really, really do. It means the world to me for you to talk to you. I, I've been watching you for a while and never did I thought maybe I would be able to start talking about stuff on YouTube and then be able to talk to Pastor Paul. And so you've kind of been my- uh, Good for starting a channel. I mean, that's, that's a good thing. Thank you so much. And um, it's almost like vicariously, you've been my pastor. Um, a lot of times, a lot of times I've went to your videos and searched through titles to see which one can I really get into today that speaks to me. And so it's almost kind of vicariously, I've, you've really been a big part um, in, in me, in, in helping me understand the theology and not just theology and understanding all these musings by these high level cognitive thinkers like Peterson, who I couldn't really break it down the way I needed to. And so coupling his talks with yours and vice versa really helped. And Mr. Peugeot as well. I look up to both of you guys and, and I wanted to say at the last, just how much, how, how much gratitude uh, I want to show towards you guys and how much I really appreciate you coming on here. It means a lot to me. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, it's a pleasure. I thought this conversation went well. Uh, after you post it, and if you're ready, I'd be happy to post this on my channel. Yeah, I, thought, I, would, I would love for you to. I thought yeah. this did. I thought this went well. So uh, I did too. I really enjoyed it, and I will most certainly pass it along to you to post on your channel. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Vanderclay. You have a great rest of the day. All right, you too. Bye bye. Bye bye.